Uh, welcome everyone to today's orientation webinar for the American Rescue Plan, American Indian Resilience and Education or ARP AIR grant program. Congratulations to all our new grantees. We'll begin as we always do with our standard disclaimer. This presentation was produced under U.S. Department of Education contract number GS00F115CA with Synergy Enterprises, Inc. The views expressed herein do not necessarily represent the positions or policies of the U.S. Department of Education. No official endorsement by the U.S. Department of Education of any product, commodity, service, or enterprise mentioned herein is intended or should be inferred. Very good, excellent. So before I get into the agenda, just a couple of, of logistical notes for today. Um, as we go through to our content today, if you have any questions, you're free to post those in the chat box so we can keep track of those and so you don't forget your questions. We will be answering all your questions at the end and you'll have an opportunity then to come off mute and also give voice to any questions that you may have at that, at that time. Um, also, as, as always, uh, when, we're, when we're online, if, you, uh, if you're not speaking, we do ask that you keep your uh, lines on mute. That just helps keep the, the audio clear and the recordings sound so that when we share this out with you later, everyone can, can hear everything. So we do have a lot of ground to cover today. We are going to be providing an overview of this grant and introduce all our awardees. Uh, then we'll dig into the particulars of your grant conditions, performance reporting, and touch on some fiscal management topics. Um, we will get into greater detail about your budget and revisions at tomorrow's workshop, and we'll share that um, time with you at, before we leave today. So first, I would like to introduce the director of the Office of Indian Education, Julian Guerrera, who has a few words to share with us now. Thank you, Tracy. I appreciate that. I have to get off mute there. Mm -hmm. Let me get to camera. Thank you so much for making a short amount of time to speak in, in front of you. I just want to say again, congratulations to all of you uh, new grantees uh, who are in charge with the American Rescue Plan, American Indian Resilience and Education Activities. I think an important thing I want to note here is the absolute priority that all of you had written to in your grants. I, I just want to also drive home a point that this is not an NYCP grant. This is not a STEP grant. This is not a PD grant. These are common, the ARP Air grants are emergency funds with an absolute focus on activities that assist and encourage Native students to enter, remain in, and re-enter school because of the impacts of the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic. I have a high amount of expectations on each and every one of you and your grants to follow through on the objectives that you set forth because the rest of the department is watching on the efforts of these American Rescue Plan funds. We have different agencies outside of the Department of Ed, whether that be the Office of Management and Budget, other executive agencies who wanna know what are the uh, promising practices that are occurring with ARP funds so, um, so that those stories can be shared. I will be routinely checking in on, on the status of your grants to know how you're doing, where you need help, and how we can support your success as grantees. So believe it or not, I, I say congratulations, but I also like to share that uh, buckle up and we have high expectations for you to deliver on the promises that you've written to each of those grants. So now is not the time to really uh, think about how you want to implement. Now is the time to start really um, seriously considering your implementation and moving forward with it. Um, the important thing to note is to um, always stay true to the purpose here and, and your absolute priority to enter into, remain in, and re-enter school for our Native kids. Um, the disparate impact of coronavirus has been significant for our Native communities and the practices that you find and the best practices that you identify, we're looking to spread uh, to other schools and other grantees to learn from you. So with that being said, um, you know, it's all about building collaboration and stronger relationships and we're committed to doing that. Um, 
as part of uh, my vision for the OIE. And I think the next steps are to make sure that you're informed, that you're supported, and that we glean uh, what we can from uh, the things that you're learning and your implementation of the projects. I'm excited for you. Congratulations. Uh, great job done. And now let's begin to get to the good part, the hard part, implementing these projects. And uh, just know that you'll be supported every step of the way from uh, the program officer level, uh, from Shala Ortega, through other supports, through the Synergy Enterprises a contractor, and or any other supports that, that we can do to make sure that uh, you're successful in your project. So thank you very much. I turn it back over to you, Tracy. Thank you. Thank you, Director Guerrero, for your words and your time this morning. We appreciate that. So let's take a look at um, that network of uh, support uh, that Director Guerrero mentioned. Here's a look at the team of leaders and the program officers at the, at the Office of Indian Education within the Department of Education. Some of you are already familiar with these names and faces. There is a formula grant team, um, as well as a group of leaders who oversee all of OIE's discretionary grants, including NAL Ed, uh, Professional Development, the STEP, as well as this, this grant program, the ARP Air program. Those of you who have multiple OIE grants or may be familiar with, with several of these leaders already. These are members of the team who are here to support you. You also have um, a technical assistance team. I'm your facilitator for today, uh, Tracy Carajarge, but I'm really just one member of a team of folks who support you in the administration of your grants and the implementation of the programs and activities. Some like me are more forward facing and you will see and hear from us in sessions like these and in email. Um, for example, my colleagues Sarah Brightwell and Olani Lilly are on, on today. Um, you'll get to know us throughout, throughout our time together. Others work more behind the scenes to make sure that you are provided with the most supportive and relevant technical assistance poss possible. And you see some of those names and faces on the screen there. Okay, at this time, I'm very pleased to introduce to you um, doc, Dr. Donna Savis Burns, our discretionary group leader, is on with us today, as well as the ARP Air Program Officer Shala Ortega. Uh, so at this time, I'd like to introduce Shala and hand it over to her. Thank you, Tracy. Um, Hi everyone, my name is Shala Ortega. Uh, I serve as the program lead and your main contact for the ARP Air Discretionary Grant Program. I'd like to congratulate you again and welcome you to our grantee community and for being one of the lucky 15 peer-reviewed applicants that received the grant award this year. Today's webinar is intended to touch base on post-award expectations, requirements, and timetable for accomplishing them. This orientation is the first of many TA sessions that we're going to be conducting to give everyone an opportunity to work out any post-award issues that may arise during the course of your grant year. In addition to group TA sessions you're going to receive, I'm also available for one-on-one -on -one TA if needed. If you do happen to find yourself in need of individualized TA from me, please let me know and we'll schedule separate web meetings to discuss your grant and any questions that you may have that are specific to your project. Having said that, however, expect some calls from me the next few days, weeks. Um, some of you have had specific conditions placed on your grant or may have had some reductions done to your award amounts. So we'll have discussions about that. And in those situations, I'll be reaching out to you to have individual one-on-one uh, -on -one sessions with you. But we will have post-award calls with each of you. And um, in that way, you, each, each one of you will get a chance to have an individual one-on-one uh, -on -one with me and go over your projects and any other um, uh, you know, issues that concerns your uh, year one activities. Next slide. Now, uh, in the next few slides, I'm going to go over the purpose and the program conditions and uh, what the priorities were in this program. Next slide. Um, 
I'm sure most of you know the purpose of this program. Um, the purpose is to support the take, uh, tribal education agencies in providing direct services to Indian students they serve. Um, and there are a number of uh, specific activities that were authorized from, uh, and from that list, you choose some uh, for this program uh, in your applications um, that we'll be talking about um, and in how you can actually provide support to your uh, Indian students in the tribe. Next slide. Um, just a quick note here, um, that there were, um, well, 45 applications that were submitted, of which 15 were, uh, were selected uh, among the peer-reviewed applications. And uh, you're uh, one of the lucky ones in that 15 that received an award. It was very competitive. And um, there was a total award amount of um, close to $20 million uh, for a three-year program. This is only a one-time program. So it, it, what you see, the award amount here, um, 6.6 .6 million uh, applies to year one grant only. So in FY22, we plan to do continuations for the award. And um, like I said, there won't be any new competitions for this um, particular program because it's only a one-time program. Next award. Um, here, uh, it looks a little busy, but just bear with me because I wanna go through some of these things. It may help you kind of have a broader picture of, of the 15 of you and what you're gonna be doing. You're not named in terms of the number of activities, but we wanted to kind of tabulate and give you a pictorial view of how many of you were doing uh, which approved activities. As um, Julian uh, mentioned earlier, <clears throat> there is one absolute priority that governs this program, and that is basically a, having a culturally relevant project that's designed to assist and encourage Indian students and youth to enter, remain in, or re-enter schools at any grade level from pre-K to 12. Um, and these, um, the, the, the absolute priority uh, as we said in the notice inviting application, um, is um, you have to uh, select one of the uh, priorities, list of priorities that were included for this program. Now here uh, we have, for example, we have a number of you, four of you, for example, for innovative programs um, that selected that particular approved activity. And what that basically means is that four of you are going to um, have that as, um, you know, pursuing innovative programs that relate to educational needs of the educational disadvantaged um, Indian children and youth. So four of you have selected that. Um, and there are other um, areas like, for example, four of you selected uh, enhancing <clears throat> Uh, institutions of higher education, um, colored in gray down below. Uh, and that is basically about programs designed to encourage and assist Indian students to work toward and gain entrance into institutions of higher education. Of all the activities we listed that you could choose from for this program, um, no one seemed to have selected the unique cultural and educational needs. That's the uh, number is zero. However, I think most of you have um, related to that in some form or aspect throughout your um, proposed activities when you submitted an application. So I'm sure that will not go unanswered um, in the uh, years to come. Um, next slide. Um, as I said, this program had only one absolute priority and a bunch of um, approved activities that went along with that. It also had a competitive preference priority that was designed to allow um, grantees who had not received any active grant in the past five years from the US Department of Education to apply for this program. And of those, there were two grantees who were new and received those points. That's Forest County and Wichita. Congratulations to both of you. If you're joining, you, you have joined this um, 
um, this um, presentation. So congratulations to both of you, and um, and I hope that uh, that uh, you know we can provide you with all the uh, help you need in order to achieve what you set out to do for this program. Next slide. Um, this program had only one uh, program requirement, and that is a, having a signed uh, agreement with each LEA uh, that, that has participating uh, students enrolled in that LEA within, this, uh, within six months of the date of your award. Now, your award started, um, I believe, November 29, 2021. So, if you count six months from that, you would fall somewhere in May of 2022. And that's when your um, submission of a signed agreement with your LEA partners, school partners are, um, are due. Um, if you are one of those tribes that has tribally controlled schools, as you're partnering uh, schools, then you're not required to have a signed agreement with those tribally controlled schools. However, if you do not have tribally controlled schools, you have to have a partnering agreement signed with those um, LEAs to make sure that the provisions in the uh, agreement and the activities that you are be working with, uh, with your LEAs are, um, are carried out. Now, um, the agreement must include provisions that allow the grantees to access data that, that is necessary for the success of the project and for reporting on project objectives. If um, you are drawing an agreement with an LEA or multiple LEAs, make sure that that is clear in your agreement. Um, the other issue I wanted to make sure you are aware of is that you, you may not need to have um, separate agreements with each LEA. If it works for you, you can combine them into one um, agreement so all partners can sign on the same agreement, or you can keep them individually. It's, it's up to you. Um, but whatever you do, make sure that each agreement you have in place is understood and what the expectations are so you don't run into any issues mid-year in terms of data collection and so forth. Next slide. Now we're gonna get to know you better or you're gonna get to know your uh, fellow grantees better. Next slide. Here's a list of who won this time. Um, and I'm proud to say that I probably worked with most of you in past uh, many years. I've been with the US Department of Education. Uh, so if I haven't worked with you, particularly as a project director, I probably worked with someone in your tribe in the past many years. So welcome and congratulations again. Next slide. And here's a map of where you are. So um, very excited to see some on the East Coast and Midwest and so on. So there are three from Alaska, which is great. Um, so that's, that's a, I, I believe that's a very good map. Next slide. So what we're going to do in the next few slides is dig a little deeper into your grant award notification. Next slide. Now, many, many of you are a previous grantee, so you're probably very familiar with this. You may be a new project director and don't know, but if you um, are familiar with it, uh, this is still a good refresher for you to see where things are. I'm not going to cover every block or everything on this um, on the slides, but uh, I just want to familiarize you where, where you can find certain information. Like, for example, in block three, you've got the, some names, you've got my names, you've got the um, uh, the name of, uh, for actually it's not a name, it's a uh, G5 payee help desk that you can contact if you have G5 information here, uh, need information about G5, that's who you contact. Uh, they're available both by phone and um, email. You may get uh, you know, a quicker response if you send an email actually. Then in block two, uh, up on the right-hand corner, uh, you have your PR award number, um, 
and that is a number particular to your award um and and it would be very helpful you remember that number and when you're contacting communicating with me or our contractor synergy that you refer that pr number in your email down below in a box five you have the project directors of record um and usually we have the level of effort listed there um now in some cases i may have to um come back to you and talk to you about your level of effort you if you're the project director um and to uh, you know to discuss that issue with you um we can only have one person designated for each grant to be uh, to appear in the key personnel box so you may have a project coordinator for example uh but that name is not going to be able to be included in that and this is a basically this is a restriction placed on what can go on G5. It doesn't come from our, our office. So um, so whoever the project director is, and that title basically refers to the person who is the main contact for the grant uh, project that we work with. Next slide. Uh, again, this is a box, several boxes for you, for, uh, you know, in your GAN. If you've received your GAN, um, you pro probably had a chance to look at how much money you received. And this basically tells you what to expect in years two and three in box six. And box seven tells you how much you received this year and what the total amount for the, uh, for the three year period would be. Now, this is an example. It doesn't mean that's how much you received. But that's where you can find the information about your, your specific grant project. Next slide. Again, uh, block eight lists a bunch of regulations and attachments that you need to kind of look at. These are important, by the way, to kind of um, keep track of <clears throat> because it's uh, basically, this is um, what we use to track how federal money is allocated. And it's important for you to know uh, what what it means. Um, so, you know, this is where you can find them. What applies to your particular grant? Next slide. Okay, and then block eight is basically more of the same regulations and attachments that are specific to your grant, and uh, <clears throat> and it, it also includes the uniform guidance for federal awards later in the in this uh, presentations you'll have links to those areas where you can access and read more about it if you wish next slide okay um here excuse me um this is uh, basically telling you the legislative authority under which this program was awarded what the program title is and um basically what year was put in place and so on and so forth, how much the amount of your first year grant award is. And this is again an, an example, it doesn't apply to your particular grant, but it's just an example of what you can find in your GAN. Next slide. Same thing, block 10. Now this is very important um, because there may be terms and conditions that are specific to your particular project that no one else has. So pay close attention to this block, see what it says. If you have any questions, if you don't understand it, let me know. I'll try to take you through them. Like I said, we can have one-on-one -on -one calls. We will have one-on-one -on -one calls in the coming days and weeks. And so, you know, if you have any issues or questions, just, uh, um, just um, remember to ask them. If you don't ask them now, ask them later. I'm always available. Next slide. Okay, here are a bunch of dates, due dates that you have to pay attention to. Uh, most of you submitted an indirect cost rate agreement that um, was probably um, uh, expired, had an expired date. Um, and so basically what this says is as the, the first due date for the indirect cost rate is for us to have um, an indirect cost rate agreement that is signed and approved, have a copy of it to us by January, 2022. Now, 
uh, mind you, obtaining an indoor across trade agreement is a lengthy process, and it may take you longer to do so, in which case you need to let me know when you submitted an indoor across trade agreement request. And typically what tribes do, they submit one to the um, US Department of Interior, and that's who you negotiate your indoor across trade agreement with. Um, project directors probably don't get involved in that. It's your probably finance um, office or the um, accounting office in your uh, tribal uh, government that engages in that um, in that activity. I don't uh, engage in in the Rakos trade agreement issues uh, in terms of you know um, negotiating agreements. That's not uh, part of what we do. But there are offices that take care of that. Like I said, in, in the US Department of Interior, there are, uh, you know, there is a, a source that you can go to to negotiate that. Like I said, most of you do did uh, submit one that probably expired. And so you probably, your uh, finance office should know how to um, navigate through what needs to be done next. If you need more time to, um, submit an indirect cost rate agreement, let me know because we need to be in the know. Um, but we do expect you to have one if you are uh, you know, um, collecting indirect cost on the activities you're gonna be conducting in year one. Um, revised project plan, if you're gonna revise, by the way, when I say revised project plan, I'm not talking about switching what you said you were gonna do in terms of those approved activities. You have to stick with them. But if you have any tweaking you need to do, uh, again, you need to think about submitting it real soon. January 2022 is the due date for that. Um, if you need to devise your budget, for example, again, I don't think you're going to do major revisions. Um, but if you need to tweak it um, because of late start or because maybe you received uh, reductions and you need to do how to navigate through that, um, again, January 2022 is the deadline for submitting any revised budgets you have. Again, you're proposing it. It doesn't mean that just because you revised your budget, it, it, it's accepted. It has to be reviewed by me, and then we can have a discussion and then go from there. Um, one thing I need to mention is that some of you may have received reductions in your budget. Um, and let me take contractual as an example. If you received a reduction in contractual, you cannot revise your budget in order to restore whatever reduction we made. The cuts stay uh, in, you know, in terms of applying, in terms of the budget category we cut. So you can't do the a budget revision to restore those cuts. But um, if you have other um, revisions that you wanna make to your budget, uh, uh, you know, we can discuss that. So January, 2022 is for you to um, submit any proposed uh, revised budget you have. Uh, signed agreement, again, we talked about that earlier. Um, if you have um, schools or LEAs that you're working with as partners who that are not your tribally controlled schools, then you have to have, you must have an agreement signed um, by May, 2022. Um, and again, this is a very cr critical date to remember. You should have enough time to put that in place. So uh, just keep me informed in terms of the progress you're making and um, whatever issues that may come your way in terms of getting those agreements to us. And the last one I wanna cover here is the timetable for those project activities that you included in your, <coughs> excuse me, that you included in your um, application. Now the application you submitted is now your approved application. So what you're gonna do is to go back, you may have already had a timetable in that application that you submitted, but you may have to review that and see how you need to tune it uh, because of the start date of this award. It uh, started in uh, November, late November. So you may have to go back and tweak that, uh, but you need to submit a timetable for what you said you were gonna accomplish and all the objectives that you received by January 30th, 2022. Next slide. Um, let's see now, there are a couple of things that I need to go over here. One is Indoraco Strait, there is an attachment four that we 
basically included with uh, just about every um, award we issued. Uh, there may be one of you that doesn't have it, but most of you do. So read that very carefully. It tells you what to do and where to go. Um, and then adjustment in funding amount is another one. Uh, and then uh, the other issue that I wanted to mention that's very important is if you are one of the grantees that has multiple grants, whether it's with, from our office or some other office within OIE, uh, I mean, the US Department of Education, um, be mindful of not mingling, commingling uh, accounts, uh, funds for these different projects. You can't take money from, say, ARPA and spending it on some other program or vice versa. Um, just make sure you're not commingling funds. You also cannot commingle funds from other sources like nonprofits or what, whatever else you're uh, pulling from in order to, um, you know, pay your, you know, with the, with the funds. Your grant funds for this program must have a separate account. Your accounting office should know how to manage that if you're not familiar with it, but you make sure that funds are not commingled for various programs. Next slide. Okay, uh, we named this tools of the trade. This is basically some of the tools you need to, to have. Um, and we try to include all we could here uh, to, to basically work on your grant project. A um, couple of things that are very important are adhering to the regulations and Edgar part 75, and there is a link here. And then I think, um, yeah, great, thank you. Um, I think the link is also in the chat box where you can click on uh, the link in the chat box and see what it there has on their part 75. It helps you, helps you with, um, with uh, some of the broader issues in terms of grants management. There's also the uniform guidance or cost principle to CFR 200. There's also a link for that later in the, in one of the slides we included later in this um, presentation that takes you through that. Um, I don't expect you to be, um, you know, fully informed in terms of what those cost principles are, but make sure that you consult um, these cost principles, talk to your accounting finance office, they probably know more about it than, than you do, so just uh, be aware of what you can or cannot do in terms of, of what you can charge to the grant. There's also your grant award notification, read your GAN, it tells you what those terms and conditions that are applying uh, that will apply to your grants or, and also your application. Like I said, the application you submitted is now your approved application. Um, do consult that from time to time um, and uh, make sure if you hire an external evaluator or say uh, you end up hiring a, a grant coordinator to help you uh, in this project, make sure you review it with them so that uh, everyone is on the same page in terms of what, what the expectations are, what activities you're supposed to be carrying out throughout the year. Next slide. And uh, here are some information about the guidance. As I said earlier, uh, there are, these are the links you can access to um, learn more about them. There's also a link uh, down below for training uh, uh, and there are training modules that you can access um, to kind of refresh uh, in terms of grants management uh, and what you need to do at your end as uh, in terms of grants management. If you hire new personnel, this is a good way to kind of introduce them to, um, you know, grants management, project management, as far as federal grants are concerned. Next slide. Reporting requirements, that's what we're going to be spending a little time on. Next slide. Now, as most of you know, um, uh, you are required to submit an annual performance report for each year of the grant. Yours is gonna come up, uh, we don't have a date, exact date yet, but since you started uh, November, uh, then it's gonna probably not be sooner, and don't hold me to it, not be sooner than June next year, probably July, we're not sure. So. Um, because you need to have some time to work things out and have something to report on. 
So what happens is that your annual performance report is actually not uh, for, for an entire year of your first year or any grad year because you have to submit it earlier than the, your grad year ends. So it's going to be basically um, a report on what you accomplish up to that date that we give you. Say if it's June or July, then it's up to June or July. Whatever you have accomplished, then that's what you report. And then what happens is that in the following year, year two, you should be able to catch up and report not just on year one, but also year two in your year two APR. Um, again, um, each budget, uh, each annual performance report includes uh, several components. There is a cover sheet. And by the way, you cannot, as you know, you cannot uh, submit a um, Word document for your annual performance report. It has to be done on the form. Um, it's a, a federal form that you have to do. It comes with a cover sheet, executive summary, and several sections to report your performance measures and budget and additional information. We'll get, uh, we'll go over this annual performance report at a uh, at length later in the months ahead, um, closer to when the APR is due. Uh, so this is just a snapshot. We'll cover more uh, next year, next calendar year. So uh, this is just to familiarize you with what what you what you expect to, what you are expected to do um, as far as year one is concerned. Next next slide. Um, this just covers the performance measures. There are two different kinds. One is specific to your project grant project, and the other one is a cumulative one for all the programs, uh, for all the projects for this particular program. The one that's, uh, that applies to all of you is called GEFRA, Government Performance and Results Act. And this is just one particular um, measure that the program has to have, and we have to report on it to Congress to show how the, how the program is progressing. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, later, we have a slide in a, uh, you know, few slides uh, past this that tells you what the GEFRA measure is and the way you would report it, it would be in your annual performance report a form and just, uh, you know, to tell us how much uh, progress you've made on, you know, where you are in terms of your, uh, your performance. Your project specific measures, however, are the measures that you selected when you submitted your application and you have to keep track of each one of them and report on them um, and have a basically, uh, you have report on them each year. You should need to show progress made in each project objective. And what you will do is you start with the baseline as far as that's concerned. And the baseline is probably something like uh, something you already had in place. Let's take an example with say professional uh, training, development. Maybe um, your tribe ha was offering uh, professional training or development uh, to teachers and um, paraprofessionals twice a year. That would be your baseline. But with year one of your grant, maybe you decided in your uh, grant project that you wanted to offer four of them in year one, five of them in year two, and maybe three of them in year three. And that would be those, uh, you start with the baseline and you report the baseline where you started from. And then each year when you're reporting your performance measure in your APR, you report on how many you actually targeted and how much of that you actually were able to carry out and complete. Next slide. And here's your um, GEFRA measures, actually one GEFRA measure. And uh, that is the number of grantees that attain or exceed the targets for the outcome indicators for their projects that have been approved by the secretary. So there's only one GEFRA measure that we're measuring. And uh, what you do in your APR, you tell us how many of those outcome indicators you have achieved so we can then report on them uh, as a whole for the program. Next slide. Um, the next few slides is, uh, are going to be covering GF on G5 online reporting. 
And um, I'm not an expert in G5 in terms of um, you know, what you need to do in order to register and so forth, but um, this is a good place to start. You um, as project, uh, project directors, you probably had to do this for your previous grants. However, you may be a new project director or you may be a new grantee, in which case it would be a good idea to, uh, for the project director to uh, register and uh, set up an email ID and passport G5. In order to do that, you have to contact G5 Help Desk to do that. We don't do that for you, but G5 is extremely helpful. If you contact them, they'll, be help, they'll help you to go through the steps and set up the email ID and passport. Please do that because when it comes to doing your annual performance report, you need to have access to G5. So it's important for you to be already you know, enrolled in the G5 access uh, in order to you know, work on your uh, annual performance report or other aspects of G5. Next slide. Um, again, this gives you steps on what you need to do in terms of setting up a sign-in uh, for, for G5. Uh, again, <clears throat> the, um, the G5 sign-in is for project directors to, to do APRs and also to access um, you know, the uh, read-only access to G5 if you need to. Next slide. Um, here is a read-only access uh, request form if you need to submit one. Again, this is for project directors who want to keep track of, um, of the drawdowns in G5. And you probably don't see them, but you have to go to your uh, accounting office or finance office to find out what how, how much was drawn down from your uh, grant project uh, budget. Uh, so it's very important for you to keep track of those drawdowns in G5 because that's what we're looking at to, to determine whether you are spending money on the activities that you, um, you, know, you said you were gonna carry out in each year of the grant. So keep track of them. You can have G5 access um, for view only, um, ask it and keep track of it and be in communication with your finance office. So uh, you and them are on the same track when it comes to drawdowns and how much money is available in your grant account for this particular grant, grant and so on. Next slide. Uh, again, we're gonna cover some uh, aspects of grant fiscal management, next slide. And, um, couple of issues here uh, that I want to, uh, you know, um, point out. One is personnel when you're uh, uh, basically uh, changing project directors. We'll get into it a little deeper later in, in this presentation, but that's one area that you need to um, basically take note of. Uh, project directors have to be, uh, if they are being changed or proposed to be changed, they have to be reviewed and approved by me. We'll get through We'll go over what you need to do in order to do that. Indoor cost rate agreement is another one. There are resources that you can access how to um, achieve that. If your indoor cost rate agreement is outdated, you need to have a current one in order to take advantage of, of um, you know, charging indoor cost to your grant activities in the, in the year you're in. Um, contracts is another piece we're gonna touch base on. That's contracting for services. Next slide. Um, as we mentioned earlier, um, the program you were awarded under AP, ARP Air is a direct service program. And uh, that what that means is that you can use grant funds from this program to spend on uh, directly on student services. That, and those are students that your LEAs or your tribe uh, is serving. Next slide. Um, contracting services for services, um, you probably most of you have contractuals included in your in your budget, and and I'm sure since um, most of your uh, previous grantees, you probably uh, know uh, what you need what needs to be done in terms of contracting ser for services. But there, as a reminder, just be mindful that just because you mentioned a name you selected for contracting services in your 
proposed application, that now that you have an approved application, that that part is also approved. We don't approve or disapprove names. If you included names of contractors in your, in your um, application, what you need to do instead is to make sure that um, if you uh, select a contractor, that it's through full and open competition, that that contractor is, is selected. If you don't know what that is, you probably want to discuss that with your accounting office, finance office, to make sure um, that that is what's being followed. And, um, and of course, typically what happens is that the tribal governments have their um, set of uh, uh, um, rules and regulations for contracting that are very much based on the state that you're in. And the state rules and regulations for contracting is very much based on the federal ac ac uh, acquisition regulations that we follow at the federal level. So we all read from basically the same, the same book when it comes to contracting for services. And like I said, in this case, make sure that if you're contracting out certain things, uh, that you are um, doing it uh, as full and open competition for these contracts. Um, one other thing I, I must uh, is, uh, mention here is that um, the project director's uh, position or role cannot be contracted out. Uh, the, and that the project director on this particular grant or any federal grant, at least in this particular situation, must be an employee of the entity that received um, the grant award. Next slide. More about contracting services, how you can uh, access the uniform uh, guidance for um, TA if you need more information on that. And uh, one other thing that I need to mention is in terms of the hiring preferences to make sure, make sure that, uh, that uh, you give um, Indian organizations and Indian owned economic enterprises as defined in section three of the Indian Financing Act of one, uh, 1974 preference in the award of contracts. Next slide. A budget changes. Um, uh, the question we have here is do all budget changes require prior approval? Probably not. However, however, if you need to make changes in your budget, talk to me first. It would be helpful to you and me to know what the, what the reason is you wanna change. I have had years of experience in, in the work I'm doing and I'll be able to help you navigate through some issues that may or may not come to your attention. Moving money from one category to another may cause some issues that uh, down the road that you may not, uh, you know, not be fully aware of. So it would be helpful for us to have a discussion. And um, also, like I said before, if we reduced your budget in one area, you cannot submit a devised budget in order to restore the cuts we make to your grant. Um, the things that need prior approval, yes, uh, changing key, the key personnel needs prior approval, um, <clears throat> changing from direct services to contracting also needs prior approval. You have to be very careful in that area. It can be very sensitive. So um, we need to discuss that. Uh, you have to have a very good um, justification to make uh, proposed changes that take you into that um, you know, asking for approval area, but you know, we can talk about it if that's what you need to do. So always keep me uh, informed in what, what needs to be done so I can help you along. Um, next slide. And here's uh, some more resources. I think we're repeating ourselves here, but we, we wanna be helpful and I apologize if we are uh, repeating some of these links to where you can find information. It's always good to have more than less. Um, here's how you can access uh, the, um, the regulations um, for cost allocation. There is a link for that and a link for the indirect cost portion and um, how you can access Q and A's in terms of indirect costs. Next slide. 
All right. Um, and here is also giving you a contact information. If, if you want to um, solicit um, a, a, you know, an indirect cost rate from the US Department of Education. If that's not the department you're going to, to solicit, you don't have to worry about that. Most of you, like I said, um, have indirect cost rate agreements or had in the past with the Dep US Department of Interior. So that's the source you need to tap into. But in case if you wanted to go you know, this way, so the, here is who you need to contact. Um, I'm not your contact for uh, indirect cost um, issues. Our office don't deal with that, uh, doesn't deal with that, but uh, here's one source you can tap into for the Department of Education if that's where you need to go. Next slide. Okay, so we're gonna cover uh, some aspects of communications and TAs. Go ahead, next slide. Um, so the way this works is that um, I work uh, with the project director and the authorized representative. Um, and if you have uh, other uh, grant staff who want to communicate with me, always make sure that the project director is included in your communications, whether it's email or calls. Uh, very important to have your project director included in communicating with me. If there are any project uh, director changes, then it has to be formal. And we have ways of doing that. Um, and it, it involves your authorized representative. It has to be a request made, uh, and it can be done through email. Uh, and it includes uh, certain documentations, uh, you know, sent to me. It has to be reviewed, so we make sure the person who's being proposed is actually has the qualifications to serve in that role, and so on and so forth. Um, and then there is also uh, contact for um, TA assistance with our contractor. Just make sure you recognize um, the email address here. So if you get it, don't dismiss it as a spam or anything. It's important for you to know where the email is coming from so you can respond to it. Next slide. Uh, again, more about project directors change. Again, like I said, this is something that has to be reviewed and approved. Um, and so um, in order to um, approve it, I have to have a written, could be an email, um, uh, from your um, certifying officials that states the rationale for the change and the percentage of time and, uh, and also include a CV for the person they're proposing for review. And uh, that's, you know, that's where we start. Um, so um, basically that's all there is. If you have any more questions, you can ask me later, but uh, go ahead to the next slide, please. Communications, again, these are the areas where you need to include what it is specifically you're trying to ask uh, TA for. Um, make sure that your grant your PR number is included in the subject line so it can be identified. Be clear on the question you're asking as much as possible. Be clear on the uh, question you're asking. Make sure that your question has a, your email question has a title. If it's budget division question, say budget division question and then include your PR number so that we know, and then include your uh, entity's name who the organization is so we know, uh, you know from uh, which entity you're receiving the request from. Next slide. Um, TA, we're gonna be conducting some TAs. We're gonna be offering, um, uh, well, we actually have one uh, scheduled tomorrow for a budget division workshop. Um, I'm hoping that uh, most of you, if not all of you, are able to attend that. We'll also have one-on-one -on -one calls with me. Uh, that would be um, another way of providing your TA. And also there will be TA for needs assessment uh, from our contractor. And so those are all sort of in the future. But the budget division workshop is scheduled for tomorrow. Please make sure you attend. Next slide. All right. Um, we have we typically have a project director meeting um, that is in person, but since COVID, we've gone virtual. And what we've done is we've consolidated project director meetings of 
for various programs within Hawaii into one program, one project directors meeting. And we had one last year uh, as a virtual meeting and it was very successful. And we intend to repeat that in the coming months. It's not gonna be in this current year, it's gonna be in the next um, calendar year. We don't know the date yet, but we'll let you know in advance what that date will be. Next slide. Okay, some important links for you. If you need to ask, access the notice inviting application, very good. Thank you um, for posting it in the chat box. The link is also in the chat box. Uniform guidance, same thing. If you need additional training resources, there is a link for that to uh, familiarize yourself with cash management and how to manage discretionary grant program. Next slide. Um, here is um, taking questions for you. I do need a three minute uh, um, time off. So uh, I'll be getting back to you in three minutes. Um, Synergy, could you take it uh, from me? I'll be back in three minutes. Sure thing. I was just uh, monitoring the chat box for, for any questions. And I did see, I think it was Carolyn had some questions about G5 access. So I wanted to make sure that you got your questions answered. Okay. Uh, I tell you what, give me three minutes and I'll be right back. Okay. I'll be right back. Sounds good. So I think it's okay now if you wanted to um, take yourself off mute. I was just checking in on the chat box to make sure that um, Carolyn had her questions answered about the about the G5 access. Uh, I was just told to check with um, help the help desk, so I'll just do that. Okay, very good. Right. Thank very you. Good. And I saw I did see a few of you asked for that invite for tomorrow's budget session to be forwarded and we'll make sure that happens. We make note of your um, um, request there. Um, well, and Tracy, one note for those who might not have seen Carolyn's um, question. Okay. If you are looking to add people to G5, please keep in mind that G5 only allows certain people to have access. So as the project director, only the official project director of record is going to be able to access the annual performance report to complete and submit that. And then your fiscal office has different access where they can go in and complete your drawdowns. But unfortunately, you can't add multiple members of your team to, to G5 to work on that report. You would need to work on it offline. And then the project director of record is the one who is able to access G5 to submit that. Thank you. So is it a paper report that, that they have to upload? Um, it's actually an online report, but we have paper forms that show you all the fields that you'll be completing. And so it's something you can use then to do your planning and get everything ready so that then when you go in to actually complete your online report, it can just be copy and pasted into the online system. Okay, so would the program director have to type it in online or would I be able to have access since I'm the finance director? No, only the project director is able to have access to the actual reporting. Okay, all right, thank you. And also just a note for everyone, we'll also hold a specific annual performance reporting webinar when the system opens for you to start that reporting as we get into the later spring, early summer. And we'll go literally step-by-step step how you go through uh, your annual performance reporting there as well. And then for those who asked about being added to the, the webinar tomorrow, I've got email addresses for Megan, Jessica, Janelle, and Andy will get you added. If anybody else needs to be added, whether it be someone who's on now or someone else from your team, just pop their email over in the chat box and we'll get them added to that event. Sorry, one last question. Do you do the drawdowns through G5 also? Yes, all of the drawdowns are done through G5. So does the fiscal person do that or does the project director have to do that as well? No, the fiscal person is able to access to be able to complete drawdowns. 
Okay, I guess I'm still having a problem with that because it doesn't even, it tells me my DUNS number is not correct. So I'll still- Yeah, call for your specific situation, it sounds like maybe there's a data entry error. So if you reach out, I'm sure the help desk can get that situated. Okay. For you. But yeah, fiscal folks are able to have separate access and, and they are able to go in and do the drawdowns and financial piece. Okay, thank um, you very much. I'm back uh, in case somebody, I uh, just heard somebody asking about drawdowns. If you're the project director, you cannot draw down. Uh, you, you're not the person to draw down funds. It would be your finance office. So you need to contact them. And work yeah, I'm with the them finance. To, I am okay. finance. Thank you. Thank you. Well, and I also see a question about the recording. We are recording today's session and that will be made available to everybody. Um, we can share the link with you when you come to the budget revision workshop tomorrow. And then it'll also be up on the OIE website. And I see we have a hand raised. Andy has a question. Yeah, I had a question pertaining to the earlier slide about LEA agreements. And here on the Navajo Nation, of course, we have various different agencies. Uh, we have BIE, public charter, parochial, tribal controlled, all sorts of fun stuff happening here. So if the project does not necessarily, well, I guess this is my part two of my question is, so the project we're anticipating is a PD essentially going to staff, teachers, administrators as well as families and then if it uh, affects the child right but not necessarily saying like we're going to work with your school it's sort of like on a voluntary basis if, if it affects the, the student or the teacher then or if they're willing to participate then they would go ahead and move forward with what we're planning here so if that's the case do we have to get an agreement with those particular schools I can see us getting agreements, no problem with charter schools, public schools, as well as um, our, well, we don't need agreements because we have tribal controlled schools. But when it comes to BIE, does that have to be with each BIE school or can we refer that to the BIE agent agency? Uh, okay, thank you for question. Could you put up, you have contracting for services. You need to switch to the agreement slide, Synergy. Okay. Sorry, I'm, I'll, pull, I'll pull that up here. No problem. Yeah, we need to go back to the slide that talks about having agreements within six months. I think that was the title. It was a program requirement. Okay, very good. Okay, back to the question. There was a lot included in the question and I'm not sure I got all of it, but here's what the program requirement applies to. It basically says that if you are um, working with an LEA or a school that is not a tribally controlled school, you must have an agreement with that LEA or school that spells out um, what you're going to be doing. And as part of that, the agreement must include provisions that allow the grantee to access data. You're going to have to have data to show what's been done in terms of student data for the success of the project and for reporting on your project objectives. So when you talk about, um, I think the, the caller, uh, the questioner asked about training, uh, teachers or something like that, I'm not quite sure. Um, whatever it is, if it involves your, um, your working with that LEA or that particular school, you probably want to spell it out what it is that you ask them to do in, you know, in agreement with what you're trying to do. If you leave out anything other than the student data access, and then find out later that, well, you wanted to train, say, uh, five uh, teachers in that particular school, but the another school doesn't agree to it because, well, their plans have changed. Well, see, you've already submitted something to that effect in terms of your, your project objectives in your, in your grant application. 
that you're working from. And if it's in your grant application, then you must adhere to your grant application, what you said you were gonna do. So the best way to deal with that is to make sure that it's spelled out in the agreement that you're gonna have with that particular school or um, the LEA to make sure everybody's on the same page. Um, a BIE school, I'm not sure, but you didn't include BIE school in uh, what you could do. Um, send me an email, tell me more specifically about what it is you're trying to do. Uh, if you're the project director, you and I need to talk about this to see um, what you mean exactly by BIE school. So that um, we can be a little more clear about that. I'm not really clear about that question, but um, this is not the only time you can ask questions. You can send me an individual email uh, so that you and I can talk uh, briefly about what it is exactly you're trying to do with your, uh, with your um, uh, agreement. You still have time to think about that, go through it. Um, but you, what you don't want to do is leave out components that, that you need to include in it. <clears throat> and then find out later that your LEA or the school you're working with doesn't agree to what you're requesting to do with them. I hope this answered. If it doesn't, send me an email and I'll try to have an individual one-on-one -on -one with you to respond yeah, to the question. When we get to that point where we each do our call-ins and our one-on-one, -on -one, I'll uh, clarify my question then. Thank you. No problem. Thank you for asking it though. Thank you. Next. Any other questions out there? While you're thinking about that, I just want to note that everybody that's put their email into the chat box to be added to tomorrow's budget workshop, we've made that happen already. Um, we've also posted the link where you can find today, where you'll be able to find today's recording after, after it's rendered and posted. We'll have that up for you to revisit. Um, and really any of our technical assistance sessions like these and tomorrow's budget workshop will get posted there. So if you don't already have that bookmarked, you can wanna bookmark that so you can revisit um, our sessions and check back there on the regular. And again, if you don't have any questions right now, but you run into some after the call in and is ended, don't worry about it. I'm here. Uh, you can still ask questions. Remember, we have three years for you to ask questions. So there are going to be questions for. So um, don't worry if you don't have any right now. If it doesn't come to you, it will come to you later. And we're always here to help you with your questions. We want you to be successful in what you're trying to do. It's not an easy job. Just remember, it takes time. And like everything else, the more time you spend on it, the more perfect you can make it. Thank you. Any other questions? I see we did get another one in the chat box um, from Chris asking if there is an MOU model available. Uh, for your six months agreement that you have to submit, uh, the agreement you have to submit. I don't have one, but um, I'll try to look into it to see if there is one available. Um, but I, all I can tell you, Chris, if it's uh, Coeur d'Alene, um, uh, that um, it, it should, whatever agreement you can come up with, it has to include certain aspects, such as the expectations, you can list them, what it is exactly you want the, your partner in LEAs or school to do. And maybe have a consultation with them and review the, um, the grant application, the aspects that apply to them to make sure they understand. Hopefully, this was probably one of the steps that were taken. Uh, it was taken by many of you um, before you enlisted the, the LEAs of the schools. But um, th th this is something that's uh, basically uh, something you have to work out with your uh, uh, partnering schools okay. in terms of the activities that you're going to carry out. So a lot of that kind of determines the shape of the agreement you're gonna have. I don't have a copy I can send you, but um, I'll try to see if I can get a hold of something to help, okay. help you along. But um, okay. until then, just try to do the best you can. Okay, thank you, Shala. You're welcome, Chris, and uh, welcome and uh, congr congratulations. Thank you. 
I'll just mention that if you were to um, visit that YouTube channel and look under the videos, um, we did we did do a data sharing agreement session earlier this this fall this summer, um, and I'll, I was just scrolling through to find find that link. So as soon as I can pull that up, I'll put that into into the chat box. But it is there on the um, on the YouTube channel for you to check out. And then we got a couple more um, folks added to tomorrow's budget session. Excellent, very good. Other questions? Okay, well, as Shala indicated, we, we are here, your technical assistance team is here, your program office, officer is here to answer any questions as they come up. Um, I'm gonna put up on the, um, on the screen now, you should see a, a link for an in-session poll. We do these at the end of any of our, our technical assistance sessions. We want your feedback, it is confidential, it's about the usefulness of the web, webinar, and we really value your feedback because we wanna hear from you what is helpful and what we might be able to do as, uh, um, as a technical assistance team to uh, support you better. And so please, uh, before you sign off today, um, fill out that, fill out those questions for us. We like to have, have your feedback. Uh, you should see it up on, the, up on the screen now. It might be hiding behind one of your applications if you have to click around a little bit, but I will leave that up for you to respond to. Um, while I share a few more important dates that have coming up that you'll want to mark your calendars. So, um, so go ahead and, and please try to try to respond, respond to that. Um, and let us know if you don't see it too. Sometimes, sometimes things get a little funny in Zoom. <laughs> but on the screen right now, you see some important dates for coming up. We've, we've been plugging the tomorrow's budget revision workshop. Uh, Tuesday, December 7th at one o'clock Eastern time, we'll kick that off. Uh, we've got everybody added to the, uh, to the session uh, that's, that's made that request in the chat box. So you still have an opportunity to, to let us know if you're not already on that. Um, coming up, what we have, what we offer some regular technical assistance offerings and some opportunities that you have to interact with your directly with your program officer, as well as us, your technical assistance team, and learn from each other. We host regular quarterly talking circles that are specific to this ARP Air grant program. So they will always, um, well, we've got some updates actually for you, for you in terms, in terms of the, the time, but you can mark those calendars January 19th, March 9th, uh, May 18th and May, uh, excuse me, August 17th are the dates for our um, for our talking circles coming up. Another another opportunity that you have to interact with your program officer and your TA team and each other um, are monthly office hours. The next session that we have coming up is December 16th, from 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we hold those every month, every fourth Tuesday of the month, and these are a little these are a little more informal. These you are you can drop in and leave as needed. You can drop in, get your questions. Answered. They're really nice too. I know a lot of a lot of you all and other other grantees from other programs will just drop in on there just to listen um, to the questions that are asked. Uh, from others, they pick up important information that way, um, and that might, you know, trigger a question for you that you can ask. That's an opportunity again to get uh, direct answers, uh, direct answers from your program officer and support from your TA team. And I see we've had a little bit of trouble with that poll. Okay, it looks like it's getting it's worked, and folks are starting to see it. I'm seeing some answers roll in now. I've got about about a quarter of you have answered. So we hope everybody will will give us their their input, their honest and candid input before before you leave today. All right, I'm going to leave you with this slide here today. These are some emails for you um, to reach out to your ARP Air program officer, Shala Ortega. 
Uh, we also have up there your the email to reach the discretionary group leader if, if that's what you need to do. Uh, also, an email to your technical assistance team is on there. Um, as we mentioned earlier in this session, it's always really super helpful for you to include that grantee name and PR number when you're emailing, um, include the program name. That'll really help us be prepared to answer your, answer your question or take your call um, and, and give you the a timely information or information in a timely manner. If you don't already follow us on Twitter, we invite you to, to join us at OIE Indian Ed. We are on, we are on the Twitter. So that's how you can get a hold of us and keep in touch. We hope that you today was a useful session. We're grateful that for your attending and congratulations on your new award. Uh, we hope that you and your project team members will be able to attend tomorrow's budget revision workshop. We will see you there.